you for joining today's SDG Dialogues, the first in a series of exchanges that aims to foster exchange on ADB's support for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The series will feature key themes explored in our corporate report on the SDGs, which was released last month. By way of introduction, I'm Smita Nakuda, and I lead engagement on the SDGs as part of the Strategy, Policy, and Partnerships Department's role as focal point on this agenda for ADB. And it's my privilege to moderate this session. With less than a decade left to achieve the sustainable development goals, the COVID-19 pandemic has set back the region's progress. Today's dialogue will explore ADB's support for member countries in their challenging journey towards achieving the SDGs in Asia Pacific. Let me first turn to ADB's president, Masa Asakawa, for an opening keynote address on ADB's approach to the SDGs. President Masa, thank you again for your time and joining us today. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Sumita. Yeah, uh, distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, it is a great pleasure uh, to welcome you uh, to this very first in the series of SDG uh, dialogues. Uh, these dialogues aim at exchanging views between ADB management, staff, and global leaders on what it will take uh, to help our developed member countries, DMCs, get on track to achieving the SDGs. It is an honor to be joined by Ms. Helen Clark, a former Prime Minister of New Zealand and UNDP Administrator for today's discussion. I also thank a German ED, Mr. Fischer, Ms. Dorette, a Director's Advisor from the Cook Islands, and Vice President Santono for joining us to share their reflections. Asia and the Pacific has been a major engine of global economic growth and made important progress on poverty reduction over the past decade. But even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the region was also falling short on all 17 SDGs. The COVID-19 crisis then laid bare underlying social and economic vulnerabilities that have hindered efforts to contain and overcome the pandemic. That is why it is imperative to renew our focus on the SDGs as countries seek to recover from COVID-19. Last month, ADB launched its first corporate report on its support for the SDGs in Asia and the Pacific. The report outlines our approach to integrating the 17 goals and their associated targets across ADB's work. The report also highlights the many ways uh, that we are helping countries make progress on the SDGs. The SDGs are firmly embedded in our long-term corporate strategy 2030. Our corporate targets on gender, climate change, and private sector mobilization are all strongly aligned with the SDGs. ADB's integrated and country-focused approach, combining finance, knowledge, and partnership, uniquely positions us to support our DMCs in their efforts uh, to achieve the SDGs. Yet, there is much more to be done and much to learn from our ongoing efforts. So let me discuss briefly how ADB can be an even more reliable and trusted partner for our DMCs to be back on track uh, towards achieving SDGs. Here, I'd like to highlight four actions. First, let us be flexible and agile in balancing our operations between our COVID-19 response, including ADB's initiatives on vaccine access and our support for a green, resilient, and inclusive recovery. In this regard, I want to highlight that even during the exceptional year of 2020, when our commitment reached a historic high of $31.6 billion and included substantial and much-needed support for COVID-19 response, about half of our investments sought to address long-term development issues, such as, such as addressing climate change and investing in quality, high-quality infrastructure. We should also identify areas that not only help to contain the pandemic, but also support a green, resilient, and inclusive recovery. Investing in digital infrastructure, for example, can help people restart their social and economic activity safely while ensuring access to basic social services, such as health and education. Second, ADB must continue to promote learning, 
reflection, and practical solutions by investing in knowledge that helps countries and stakeholders take on issues related to SDG implementation, especially localization of the SDGs. Implementation of the Knowledge Management Action Plan came up and recommendations in the Reg uh, Resident Mission Review will be strong enablers for us in this regard. Third, ADB needs to strengthen and sustain partnerships for the SDGs with development partners and the UN system. New partnerships with private sector actors and philanthropic organizations can also play a vital role. Fourth, we must help our DMCs mobilize the widest range of resources, sources of private and public finance uh, to invest in the SDGs. ADB has an important role to play in helping DMCs maximize financing opportunities while supporting implementation of SDG 17. Domestic resource mobilization or DRM uh, will be a crucial pillar in this effort because SDG 17 is the foundation for achieving all of the other SDGs. ADB is scaling up its effort in this area through partnerships with governments, businesses, and international peer organizations. In this regard, ADB announced the creation of a regional hub on domestic resource mobilization and international tax cooperation last September, and it will be officially launched at ADB's 15th annual meeting in May uh, this year. This hub will provide an open, inclusive, and pan-regional tax platform for strategic dialogue, institutional and capacity development, development and knowledge sharing and cooperation. Before ending my remarks, I want to stress uh, the importance of working the sustainability talk. For ADB to remain a reliable and trusted partner for DMCs in their efforts to achieve the SDGs, our own work style, internal management, and the institutional footprint must also be sustainable. So let us work in a sustainable manner, encouraging each other to balance life and work. Let us continue to make every effort to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in our own workplace. And let us ensure that ADB maintains other financial sustainability and organizational resilience it needs to carry out its work through uncertain, uh, uncertain times. I'd like to conclude by thanking you uh, for your commitment to achieve the SDGs through the joint efforts of our DMCs and ADB. I look forward to an engaging panel discussion on opportunities for ADB to deepen and strengthen its support for the SDGs at this critical juncture for our region. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Thank you very much, President Massa, for those opening remarks, reaffirming the need for continued focus on the SDGs as we support our countries to build back from the COVID-19 pandemic. It's now my honor to turn to our panel for their views and reflections on ADB's contributions to this challenging agenda. Let me turn first to Ms. Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand and Administrator of UNDP. Ms. Clark, you were actively engaged in the formulation and negotiation of the SDGs and at the helm of UNDP as it considered opportunities to integrate the SDGs into its operations. We'd really value your thoughts on the relevance and resonance of the SDG framework and how institutions such as the ADB are finding value in it, particularly in the context of COVID-19 recovery. So the floor is yours, thank you. Well, thank you. And, and one thing that gives me optimism about the future of the SDGs is when major regional development banks like the ADB take them very, very seriously. If the financing institutions don't put them at the heart and centre of their programming and planning and partnerships with countries, we can't get anywhere because SDGs require political commitment and they require money to go with it. And you are such an essential part of, of that partnership. So the SDGs were relevant to the Asia Pacific uh, before the pandemic, and they're relevant during uh, the recovery and, and hopefully a beyond phase when we can see uh, development trajectory, sustainable development trajectory speed up again. I think they, they've always spoken to very important uh, development challenges in the region, 
and they recognize the interconnectedness. And that's where I think the power of the thinking of the bank is also very important, that you get the connections between the SDGs. We've seen what's happened in our region and globally, where we've gone helter-skelter after human development, really at, at any price to the ecosystem and the planet. And we know that's not sustainable because we get to a tipping point where we can't make further gains in human development because we've started to erode the natural ecosystems and the ecosystem services which sustain uh, life on Earth itself. So seeing that bigger picture as the ADB does, I think is, is so critical. Now, of course, uh, great as the human development progress has been in, in Asia, and particularly in the East and Southeast Asian uh, regions, we're still not there, are we? We're still seeing quite significant residual poverty in, in the region. And we can't uh, resolve that, we can't overcome that on the old business as usual model. So again, the integrated thinking of the bank on how you have inclusive and green and resilient movement forward, particularly at this time of trying to move out of COVID, uh, becomes incredibly important. We have to uh, course correct. Now, where I think the bank and its uh, capacities can be extremely useful uh, is in the dimension of ensuring that countries are aware of the risks and have risk-informed uh, development. Banks know about risk. They assess risk all the time uh, before they lend. And of course, in our region, uh, we saw the birthplace of the Sendai framework for disaster risk uh, reduction. And probably when most people think of that, they're thinking of the seismic events, the earthquakes, the dreadful tsunamis that, for example, Japan and others uh, have experienced. They think of rising sea levels, the, the extreme climate uh, events. And yet Sendai also had very appropriate references to the risks of pandemics and the need for preparedness and therefore uh, risk reduction. And I think that now needs to be much more deliberately factored into all development uh, uh, planning and, and programming, because we've seen how this incredibly ill wind of COVID has thrown the world even further off course uh, on SDGs. The president of the bank, when he spoke quite just now, quite rightly uh, reminded us that the SDGs had been in some trouble uh, prior to COVID. Well, COVID came along and just you know, kicked the, the capacity to reach these goals by uh, 2030 even, even further away, unless we really not just redouble, but uh, treble uh, efforts. Uh, so I think uh, as uh, the region now focuses on the movement out of the pandemic phase of, of COVID, uh, the need to retain a high degree of vigilance against it in its endemic phase, because that's what we're moving to, uh, will remain, along with the need to lift ambition for building preparedness and response for future uh, pandemic uh, threats. As I said, I, I see the role of, of ADB as being very important on this. You know, we, we talk inclusive and sustainable development. We must always put resilient in there, or we'll be blown off course by the ill winds, whatever form of ill wind uh, that it is. And I think that often investment uh, in preparedness and in risk reduction can take a back seat in better times. It's like the dog that didn't bark. So it's not barking, you're not giving it attention. And then along comes what has been for the world a once in a century event of a pandemic. And we think, oh my goodness, we knew we were supposed to be prepared but so many of us weren't. I might say some of the, the better examples of preparedness come out of the East Asian uh, region, and we can all learn from that as well. And the world is looking for good models to follow on this. And again, ADB bringing its capacities, its perspectives, its skills to support countries on this journey to more resilient, inclusive and sustainable development to meet the SDGs is incredibly important. So let me leave my, my opening comments at that. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Clark, um, and especially for emphasizing the point around resilience um, as a key continued area of focus and even greater focus moving, moving ahead. I'd like to turn now to Mr. Lay, currently an advisor with the ADB board suite representing Armenia, the Cook Islands, Fiji, Indonesia, the Kyrgyz Republic, New Zealand, New Samoa, and Tonga. Um, in many, fact, many highly vulnerable regions there that have been advocating for greater resilience for, for many years. Um, you previously served as the Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister of the Cook Islands and Head of its Ministry of Interior. And we'd be really interested in your views on how the SDGs add value to DMC's engagements with development partners and the extent to which the holistic nature of the SDGs provides a framework for taking on these increasingly complex and interconnected challenges that Ms. Clark alluded to in her remarks. Mr. Olay, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, at its heart, I think the SDGs provide a unified and common framework that helps with prioritisation at the national level, and it helps frame the dialogue between DMCs and development partners. I reflect back on the Cook Islands experience of setting its five-year national sustainable development plan in 2015-2016 after the SDGs were introduced, and it involved a comprehensive bottom-up sectoral approach, national consultations, which we then overlaid with the SDG global agenda. And this helped us focus in on areas where new and refocused efforts were needed. As an example, the Cook Islands, like many small island developing states, was completely reliant on importing fuel at extremely high costs, given small quantities, remote shipping distances, we set a national goal to reduce the reliance on fuel imports while delivering on energy security. This aligned perfectly with goal seven of the SDGs and was hugely important in focusing development partner assistance towards infrastructure that could transition the country to renewable energy and build economic resilience. Um, secondly, I think that the SDG framework has also added value in rebalancing positions between developing and developed nations, which is empowering and, and can help identify relevant context-specific solutions. So for Pacific countries, the SDGs framework has given a greater voice to some of the smallest countries in the world that lack global influence and often struggle to get visibility. So goal 14 on conserving and uh, sustainable use of uh, oceans helps rebalance the dialogue between developed and developing countries in the Pacific. We've seen a transition in the mindsets of small island developing states who now see themselves as big ocean states, as they are custodians over vast ocean spaces and they're integral to ocean ecosystem management and achievement of goal 14. But on this goal in particular, it does highlight a paucity of data and a lack of progress of, of all the SDGs. However, that in itself is a signal of where support may be needed. Um, but more broadly, I believe that the SDGs, they do give a greater voice and therefore greater responsibility to different regions of the developing world who are then empowered to take on greater ownership of issues that they have the greatest influence to change, which can result in more meaningful discussions with development partners and better outcomes. Uh, on the holistic nature of SDGs and whether it provides a framework for taking on increasingly complex and interconnected development challenges, I, I believe it does. Uh, the SDGs help us to think beyond national borders and recognise the regional public and global public good nature of many of the development challenges, including climate change, global pa pandemics, civil un unrest and conflicts, trade and mobility, migration. These are real issues that ADB member countries face and, and development organisations like ADB are set up to help combat. So we should be thinking of interventions as integrated solutions to these complex challenges. So achievement of individual goals of the SDGs help reinforce and support other SDG goals. Investment in education can provide quality education. Sorry, it, it can provide quality education for all, uh, which can provide improve gender equality, which can improve decent work, economic growth and contribute to ending poverty. So integrated approaches are needed now more than ever, given there are less than 10 years of action to achieve the 2030 agenda and COVID-19 forces us to be more ambitious, more creative and more collaborative. 
I think ADB has made a good start in using the SDGs as a framework to, uh, to take on more complex and interconnected development challenges. And this is basically strategy 2030. The strategy 2030 is aligned to the SDGs, including the corporate results framework as indicated by President Musser. The seven operational priorities of strategy 2030 are thematic in nature, and they, they, that calls for more integrated approaches. But there remains many challenges for implementation to achieve those integrated solutions. And it's good to see there, that there is intention by ADB to strengthen the linkages further between the seven op operational priorities and cascading that down more to the, the country level and the project level. Um, the 2020 annual evaluation review called for more effort to focus on pathways of how ADB's operations at the country and project level can meaningfully uh, contribute to the achievement of the SDGs. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mr. Lay, um, and emphasizing the need for those integrated approaches as reflected in, in the thrust of Strategy 2030. I'd like to now turn to Mr. Fischer, Executive Director representing Germany, Austria, Luxembourg, Turkey, and the United Kingdom on ADB's board. Mr. Fischer, you bring a wealth of experience with global sustainable development institutions and encouraging them to work to support more effective development cooperation. And we'd be very interested in your perspectives on the role of multilateral institutions such as the ADB in helping countries take on the SDGs and some of ADB's core strengths and achievements in this regard so far. Mr. Fisher. Thanks a lot. And uh, first of all, thanks for convening this, this panel. Uh, it's important to talk about the SDG right now. As you said, uh, we have less than 10 years to go and we are off track. So. Uh, important and urgent issue. In a way, uh, in answer to what Helen Clark said, uh, I would say yes, ADB is well placed uh, to make an important contribution to achieving the SDG in our region. And I believe that for three reasons. In short, uh, ADB knows about resilience. Two, ADB has privileged access to decision makers in different countries. And three, ADB is a convener. Now, please let me expand a little bit on these three points I, I want to make. First, uh, resilience. Uh, thinking back of 2015, when we discussed uh, what the SDGs and the 2030 agenda is all about, uh, we already discussed that the idea, the purpose is to empower countries to achieve the SDGs even in difficult circumstances. This was the idea, and I think we now need to deliver on, on this idea by uh, supporting partner countries uh, to improve their resilience. And uh, everyone knows, not only thinking about the Sendai framework, that uh, ADB knows one or two things about resilience. Um, this has to do with how the institution is structured. This has to do with the historical experience in the region. And uh, I have no doubt in my mind, this is one of the core strengths uh, ADB can bring to, to the table. Uh, second, um, ADB has privileged access to decision makers in, in different countries. Uh, Helen Clark reminded us of the integrated character of of the SDG, and that's, I think, what's, what's new to this agenda. It forces us to think, uh, uh, to, to connect the dots and think about uh, what does trade policy do to tax policy, what does tax policy do to infrastructure, and what does infrastructure do to gender relationships. It's a hard task. I can tell you from Germany, um, it, it's not easy, but it's necessary. And I think access to high level decision makers in different countries allow ADB to help countries connect these, these dots. Because without high level access, it won't happen. And we won't even find uh, the opportunities to, to support. Uh, one very interesting um, access point and entry point I want to highlight is uh, the new priority um, President Massa has, has given to DMC, domestic resource mobilization, because there's no doubt uh, this is essential uh, for resilience and for achieving the SDG. 
Uh, final point, ADP is a convener. Um, I see that on many levels, but most directly I see it at the board where I experience uh, exactly how multilateralism is supposed to work. Very different opinions and points of views and experience are brought to the table. Every voice is heard. And at the end, we come to consensus. And uh, I can say, uh, of course, I'm biased because I'm a member of the board, but I can say uh, what we achieve is resilient consensus, is solid consensus. This is what we need to, to achieve the, the SDG, given that, as, as Helen Clark uh, reminded us, uh, it's not only an integrated agenda, uh, it's also about international collective action. The SDG is something no country can achieve alone. And ADB is one of the, the many platforms where countries really can cooperate uh, in achieving the, the SDGs together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edie Fisher. And in your remarks, you highlighted some of ADB's key functions when it comes to the SDGs. We'd like to now turn to our audience for some of their views since we have more than 450 participants tuning into our webinar at the current moment um, with a polling question. Um, so you should be seeing a window pop up on your screens and we'll give you about 15 seconds to offer your views on which of these three ADB functions will be most critical to ensure COVID-19 pandemic recovery advances the SDGs. And we appreciate that all three of them are important, um, but to give you the option of all of the above would probably have been too easy. So we thought this would be a good way to kind of see where our audience feels that ADB's particular comparative advantage might lie into the future. So pretty even split actually, almost a third for each of our three options, I guess reinforcing um, the feeling that all three of these functions are going to have to buttress and support each other if we're gonna deliver on this one in a hundred year challenge of recovery um, from the pandemic to put us on track towards the SDGs. So with that context in mind, let me turn back to our panelists um, for some of second round of reflections on where the opportunities for ADB really lie as we seek to deepen our efforts on this challenging agenda. So let me first turn back to Mr. Fisher. Um, what do you see as some of the key priorities and challenges for ADB as we continue to deepen our focus on the SDGs and support countries to recover from the pandemic? Uh, in fact, that, that's uh, such a large question that I, I can only at best uh, scratch the surface and again, uh, try to make three points. Um, if you look at uh, where we stand as Asia Pacific region, uh, what strikes me is that progress against the SDGs has been uneven. Not only if you compare countries, but uh, maybe even more if you compare different SDGs. And um, it's obvious to, to state that we have made progress on some fronts and we didn't progress as well on, on other front, fronts. And we would probably rather uh, see an integrated, uh, more balanced progress on, on, uh, on different fronts. So the first challenge I, I would see is uh, to think about uh, how we can find and develop a, a development path that balances uh, different priorities uh, that thinks about uh, how do we achieve progress, say, on, on poverty reduction, energy access, without sacrificing environmental sustainability and social equity. Um, because these, these one-sided, that's historical experience, uh, these one-sided development paths, uh, they just aren't sustainable. And that's, I think, one urgent thing to, to think about. Uh, the second thing I think uh, is a little bit coming back to my previous point on resilience. Um, my understanding of the SDG is uh, it's not about only achieving the SDGs, it's about maintaining them, sustaining them, preventing uh, retrograde uh, de developments. And that's why uh, we really need uh, to to think about how we do, do we strengthen um, country and local systems so that they are strong enough to withstand uh, and respond to crises by, uh, with, with their own, own devices. Again, uh, resilience. 
eventually, I don't believe uh, MDB, ADB, or any outside institution uh, is there to, to fill gaps and cover needs. Of course, that's what we do in, in crisis times like, like these, but uh, that's not our core ma mandate. Our core mandate is to empower uh, countries uh, and to help them achieve a situation where they can really uh, grapple with problems uh, uh, themselves in cooperation, of course, with, uh, with their neighbors and with other international partners. Um, final thing is uh, we need to anticipate threats. Um, as important as it is to uh, have a sustainable response to, to the pandemic crisis, um, and I'm afraid we haven't seen the last of it, just as important is to anticipate uh, future risks, future crises. You may think about debt, you may think about the next pan pandemic, and most importantly, you must think about uh, climate uh, and adaptation. Uh, because uh, every time I look at uh, the findings of the IPCC, uh, main message coming out is time is running out. And uh, that's why we need to anticipate and uh, look for protection uh, in order to, to protect what we have achieved in terms of SEG against backsliding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. If I could turn now to Mr. Olay for a complimentary perspective on the same question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think yeah, further to uh, Edie Fisher's comments on, on these broader ideas, um, when I look at this question, I do think about uh, some more of an inward looking at what ADB can do now. So I, I think ADB has a, a good foundational corporate document in strategy 2030, but it can deepen its focus on SDGs within that sort of focus um, by building further on this. Uh, strategy 2030 has enabled ADB to already ensure their institutional approaches are aligned particularly those linkages with the corporate results framework and operational priorities, but more can be done to embed the SDGs at the country level uh, and in projects. And for me, I, I would like to see country partnership strategies that are developed with a, a clear assessment and diagnosis diagnostics of, of the country's progress towards the SDG goals um, achievement and how countries are prioritising actions to achieve them. Um, I think there is an opportunity within the, the CPS uh, format to capture information on the role of development partners and, and where they can assist with uh, achievement of the SDGs. Um, ADB as a multilateral organisation is in a, in a good position where it can leverage support from development partners. And um, I think we need to identify where those gaps are and, and look at ADB's comparative advantage relative to other development partners and close in on those. Um, an approach used in the Pacific um, centres around joint policy matrices, uh, which is fundamental to ensure that overlaps and duplication is minimised and recognises that development partners may be dealing with capacity limited administrations that are thin on the ground. But for me, I mean, I don't get a great sense that SDGs have been foremost in mind when developing recent CPSs, but I think it's uh, critically important that there is close consultations with countries to understand their priorities in the context of the SDG goal attainment um, and to assess the level of country ownership of the SDGs, because I think that's so important if we're going to build the resilience of countries to achieve um, these goals. Um, ADB has the opportunity with its resident missions. So resident missions are often at the forefront of the discussions with DMC. So we need to also ensure that resident missions are well supported and have the right knowledge and capacity to engage with DMCs. Um, also just internally looking, I think there are a number of key upcoming policy discussions where ADB has potential to accel accelerate this progress um, towards the SDGs further. Um, recognizing the current pandemic prevents progress on many of the SDG goals. The real-time evaluation on COVID responses um, that the IED carried out provides an opportunity to review and reconsider the existing tools available through ADB that can help uh, DMCs contain the pandemic and, and advance its recovery efforts. Uh, the issues affecting global supply of vaccines, particularly for our members, is concerning, and it may mean that the SDGs become unattainable 
unattainable by 2030, uh, and it take it could take longer um, when the when we can contain the pandemic. So, so there's that. But in addition to this, I think um, we need to look closely at how the COVID impact is having different effects um, and unprecedented uh, economic impacts, particularly on the smallest members uh, that are tourism dependent, and whether ADB's tools are sufficient for. Uh, even those members right at the edge um, of its membership. Um, ADB will soon be considering the new energy policy, a safeguards policy, as well as reviewing its uh, disaster and emergency, emergency assistance policy. And I think all of these provide a, a critical juncture um, for new pathways where ADB can deepen its focus on, on achieving the SDG goals. And I'd like to see how ADB can better assist countries with knowledge solutions and how the knowledge management action plan and the review of the technical assistance could help countries on their pathway to achieving the SDG goals. I mean, for me, I, just two final points that I, I want to leave, um, leave here in terms of opportunities. And the first is to emphasise again how advancing gender equality is so, so critical to the achievement of the SDGs and how I, I think this alone can address so many interconnected development challenges. And, and my final point is the importance of differentiated approaches. And this, I think, is uh, one of the points that Edie Fisher referred to and how ADB can help support DM is achieving the SDGs through its diverse membership with diverse approaches. Um, an approach in a smaller DMC will not be appropriate for an approach in a larger, um, a larger DMC. And the context is critical and having the ability to respond to these, I think, uh, is very important. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Verlay. And if I could turn now uh, to Ms. Clark, uh, looking to the future, where do you see the opportunities for renewed multilateral support for progress towards the SDGs? Well, lots of opportunities. And uh, as uh, Bradina just said, uh, for ADB, it will be a question of, of looking at where with its mandate and capacities, uh, the opportunities uh, lie for it. Uh, but I think a key thing for the multilateral system is to keep the SDGs on the agenda, because we do have a habit multilaterally of having great years and big agendas, but then sort of life goes on without them being so front and, and center to, to national planning and the, and the focus of institutions, which is why ADB really focusing on SDGs is, is so critical in the region. Uh, secondly, as Roger Fisher also uh, emphasized, it is about continuing to drive home uh, in the dialogue with governments, the interconnections between uh, the SDGs. You know, traditionally we've gone for growth. You know, GDP growth has been the holy grail. And, and of course, with GDP growth, it comes a, a, a certain amount and often a great deal of, of human development because countries have the resources to pour into it. But you get to a tipping point where the damage you've done to your ecosystems and getting that growth and development will bounce back and it'll hit you in the face and it will stop future uh, human development progress. I remember eight or nine years ago releasing a UNDP human uh, development report uh, on uh, environment and, and inequality, which pointed out that on worst case scenarios, and we're probably staring at those, if we continued the pace of environmental degradation, uh, and uh, exacerbating inequality, uh, then we would see human development slow to a crawl and even regress in South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is not a, a good scenario. But another thought has occurred to me uh, as, as a way of, of seeing uh, economic health and development relevant relative to uh, other considerations. Often when you're talking about the importance of uh, mitigating uh, against uh, climate change, uh, countries will think, well, how am I going to do that and sustain the level of growth I need to move my people uh, out of poverty? Now, of course, <laughs> the insight from the Nick Stern report of all those years ago in the UK was that climate change is going to cost us. And the longer we delay action, the more costly it will be. So action now is, is important. And it seems to me that 
with the pandemic also, we've seen an economics versus health argument in some countries, which has been quite disastrous. So countries that said, well, you know, we can't take firm measures because it will damage the economy have ended up, in my opinion, and I think evidence will support this, in a worse position than those who took the pandemic head on with strong measures and endeavoured to, to deal with it. So we can't just go for growth and ignore the fact that a great many people are getting sick. We can't just go for growth and ignore the fact that uh, uh, the climate and other ecosystems are diminishing before our eyes. We have to have much more holistic views. Now, a point to, to raise here was I did note that the independent uh, evaluation uh, done for the bank last year did recommend that ADB formally change its policy with respect to coal-fired uh, power stations. And I think, at least as far as my research shows, uh, still as of early this year, ADB, uh, while it hasn't lent on coal, now for, since 2013, which is eight years ago, still hasn't formally uh, ruled it out. I would say uh, that with respect to the role the bank can play in SDG achievement and in supporting countries to meet uh, the goals set by Paris, you know, not seeing coal finance ever again <laughs> is rather important. And it's not that there aren't options, that there are other options for, for many. Uh, but the bank then becomes a very important source of knowledge about what those options are, what investments need to be put into them uh, to enable countries to move forward with, with more sustainable energy solutions. If I was looking to major contributions for ADB, I think this area of sustainable infrastructure is just so critical across energy, across transport, across the whole thinking about sustainable cities and, and how, they're, how they're designed. And, and so many of the world's mega cities are in, in Asia. So if, if Asia can get this right, you know, it, it's, it's just a, a model for, uh, for the world. Uh, housing, again, you know, in, in parts of Asia, housing totally suboptimal. What, what is the bank's role going forward in, in, in addressing sustainable housing and solutions as well. And then I know the, the bank thinks a lot about the human capital issues, you know, the importance of health, uh, the importance of, of, of education, and, and its role there in building human capital will be extremely uh, important. Of course, to uh, lock in and sustain uh, development gains, governance is also extremely important. And, not necessarily an area that, that's so easy in all aspects for development banks to get into, but you do have allies who work on these issues. And if I could give an example, which is relevant to the region because the region has uh, significant uh, energy resources. Uh, one of my current hats is to chair the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. And we uh, pursue the holy grail of, of good governance and best practice uh, in the uh, extractive industry sector on the basis that citizens deserve to benefit from the birthright of natural resources which their countries have, uh, but often haven't seen the benefit because of, of leakage, uh, shall we say, uh, into, into um, private gain and not, uh, and not public benefit. So finding, finding those uh, partnerships with others who can advance uh, good governance, I think is critical. My old organization, UNDP, also, of course, has long had a, a mandate in, in that area. So that would just be some of my thoughts about uh, how the, the bank might think about its added value uh, going ahead. And I reiterate, I'm encouraged by the focus encouraged by the fact the seminar is happening and really op very optimistic about the role the ADB can play. Thank you very much, Ms. Clark. Um, very insightful set of reflections on, on the many opportunities that lie ahead in our region um, and for our institution. Um, and let me now turn to Vice President Bambang Susantono, um, our Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development, for some closing reflections, um, particularly on behalf of management. Mr. Susantono. Thank you so much, um, 
Smita, and thank you very much to President Massa and all our distinguished panelists for their thoughtful insights and also reflections during this dialogue. I noticed that the words resilient and integrated or interconnectedness came up several times during the discussion. I think this is in line with the ADB SDG 2030 program, which is holistic, comprehensive, and integrated among sectors and themes of development. Since the SDG were formally adopted, ADB has worked to support our developing member to make progress on achieving the targets. We continue to invest across our systems to refine and to strengthen the links between development programs and the SDGs. As today's discussion made clear, a multifaceted approach is needed to continue to strengthen our development effectiveness. It is also clear that much more needs to be done. Our work during the decade of actions will be critical if we are to deliver on the SDGs, despite the amplified challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our discussion today has highlighted the vital role that knowledge and partnership play in working with our developing members if we are to move closer to achieving the ambitions of sustainable development. The SDGs are more than a government agenda, that's for sure. They involve all of us, whether development partners, civil society, academia, or the private sector. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. Through ADB Strategy 2037 operational priorities, we are taking on the issues at the very heart of the SDGs. ADB will continue to support policy dialogue on SDG-related issues and work actively on policy processes. This includes our partnership with UNSCAP and UNDP to coordinate knowledge and data on the progress toward SDGs. Just a few weeks ago, we launched Tripartite, our 2021 report, which highlighted the opportunities for greater regional cooperation and accelerated digitalizations that can help countries recover from the pandemic and set the stage for more inclusive growth. We support efforts to localize the SDGs across the region, working with diverse subnational stakeholders to move forward on the SDGs. We all know that public finance alone cannot meet the needs of the ambitious SDG agenda and, mobilize, and mobilizing finance from diverse sources, particularly the private sector, will be vital in getting closer to SDG targets. The fiscal stress caused by the pandemic response has simply added to this financial challenge. Aligning this private financing with the SDGs will be essential, and we must continue to innovate to help our developing members better harness and attract diverse sources of SDG-related finance. We can use our array of knowledge products, policy advices, and technical assistance to make further headway on this agenda. This will include ADB Ventures and our innovative green financing facilities, among others. Our own goal is to become an ever more effective knowledge institutions. ADB recently approved Knowledge Management Action Plan, or KMAP, will allow us to optimally combine expertise with financing to foster the innovations needed to progress on the SDGs. Drawing in new partners with new perspective will be the key. For example, universities across our region are establishing SDG centers to consider the local dimensions of SDG works. Entrepreneurs are using the digital economy to create new opportunities for jobs and employment. We know that a big portion of MSMEs, the micro, small, and medium enterprises in our region are run by women and youth who have been severely affected by the pandemic. I'm very proud to see that despite problems they face, many of them are developing new solutions to our region's evolving challenges. We must step and encourage these dynamisms as we support country efforts to build forward better and achieve the SDGs. The dialogue today is just a beginning of a webinar series. I'm looking forward to the rest of the series. And let me close by reading this quote, which reflects the SDG spirit. We leave no one behind. We do not turn back and we pull each other up. Thank you and back to you, Smita. 
Thank you very much, VP Susantono. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for their thoughtful insights into the opportunities and challenges that this agenda poses for ADB. Um, as noted, this is the first in a series of SDG dialogues that we'll, we, we will be convening this year that focus attention on various elements of ADB's support for the SDGs and opportunities for us to learn um, from for good practice amongst others and foster reflection on opportunities to deepen our approach through our operations and knowledge work. Many thanks to all of you again for joining us for today's session, and we hope that you will be joining us for future ones as well. Again, a huge thanks to our panelists for their time and insight, and a good day to all of you, wherever you are. <laughs>